the incredible work that we do on a very small budget is mostly because of the great volunteers that we have. A third of our membership, which is a lot, are really dedicated volunteers that work with us uh, every week of every year, and it's really amazing. So if you have any interest at all in Friends of Mary Meeting Bay and uh, more, knowing more about what we do, um, there's plenty of material here. We have a clipboard going around for people who aren't members and people who are all, you can all please all sign up. If you have interest in um, uh, volunteering or learning more about the work that we do, which is research and advocacy and land conservation and school outreach programs for all of the elementary schools here. And we do two bay days every year where we get the kids outside, out of, from in front of their computers and into the mud. So it's a great, great way to get no child left inside. Gary Lawless is a poet uh, and a bookstore owner, as we know, Gulf of Maine Bookstores right here in Brunswick, Maine. A book editor and a publisher, and his publishing um, company, which is Blackberry Books, is in Nobleboro, where Gary lives now. He's born and raised here in Maine. Um, he's been an adjunct professor at Bates College, teaching creative writing and environmental literature, and was a poet in residence in the town of Sitka, Alaska, where the top of my guitar was made. Uh, and National Park Service at the Isle Royale National Park at Lake Superior in 1998. Uh, Gary's taught creative writing for five years at MSAD 75 Adult Education Program and now teaches at the Midcoast Senior College. Um, during June and July of this year, he will be the artist in residence at the Beach Hill Preserve, a coastal mountain land trust property. I want to add, which is not in this bio, that Gary is a really good bass player. <laughs> And is in, in, the, in the, do you mind if I say this, in the band, Leopard Girls. So if you have a chance to go see Leopard Girls anytime, they play around here fairly often, and it's really fun. So, uh, so please also, if you love Gary's poetry, you will also love his bass playing, I promise. So I would like to introduce now uh, Gary Lawless, and I will. My introduction to Merry Meeting Bay came years ago through my great departed friend Bryce Muir, who used to take me out on Merry Meeting Bay, and, and uh, he would come down to the bookstore, and my wife Beth would just start getting really nervous because Bryce would always come down and say, "Let's go play, Gary. Let's go play." And he and I would, I would leave with Bryce, and uh, all sorts of mayhem would ensue. It never any adventure on Merry Meeting Bay with Bryce never turned out the way it was supposed to, leading to his ultimate adventure where he was supposed to just go skating and instead went through the ice. Um, but whenever I think of Merry Meeting Bay, the first thing I think of is Bryce and, and uh, going out yarding in, in, the, in the, the yacht. I think Stephen went yarding. David, did you go yard? Yeah. Bryce would take a bunch of artists and poets and musicians and dancers and go out on the boat and uh, we would all do things and come back and it was great. Um, but I've given a talk sometime in the last 40 years. I've given at least one other, other talk for Friends of Mary Meeting Bay. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organization that really speaks to my heart, even though I don't live in this watershed, and as you're about to find out. Um, I live on Damariscotta Lake, so a little bit east of this watershed. And the way I came to live there was in the early 1980s, we had a a woman customer who would sweep into the bookstore, and she was a large woman, and she would come in and buy books about horses and books about large dogs and poetry and mythology, and uh, turned out that her name was Kate Barnes, which I, I knew her as Kate Barnes for a while, and then I eventually discovered that her m mother and father were Henry Beston and Elizabeth Coatsworth, who I had read and admired, and uh, Kate posed the idea. To Beth and I lived at that point for 10 years in South Harpswell in a two-room cabin without plumbing uh, with, a, with a wood stove and four dogs. And Kate at one point said, my mother's in her 90s. She's living by herself at the farm. There are six horses there. There's all, you know, there are 100 years of accumulated stuff. Would you and Beth be interested in moving to the farm when she passes away? And, and I wasn't in any hurry to force Mrs. Coatsworth to pass away. So I didn't, you know, I didn't jump on that. But when, when Elizabeth passed away, there was a need for someone to go to that farm uh, because all of a sudden there were six horses and a pony and a house full of old cool stuff that none, no one in the family wanted to deal with. So they thought, well, let's have someone live here and then we don't have to deal with any of that. We don't even have to shovel the manure. We'll just have someone live here. Um, so that was in 1986. And I was, I was a Maine kid, but I'd never been around horses. And I thought, what? What problem can 
six workhorses be, you know? <laughs> and I moved there in November and quickly discovered that the world revolved around hay, water, and manure. <laughs> and there were times that first winter when I would have gladly paid rent to live somewhere else. Uh, and, um, but it, I still live there. That was 1986. She said maybe one or two years. Um, I still live there. Uh, Kate just died last year. Um, left the house and barn to, to Beth and I. So now we own it. Or we will someday when the, when the courts get done with it all. Uh, but in the process of being there, Kate, Kate didn't like paperwork. She didn't like paying taxes or getting licenses or registering her car or stuff like that. So she never did any of that stuff. Um, and she owned a 90-acre parcel that went across a peninsula with 6,000 feet of shore frontage when you added the two sides together. This beautiful, beautiful old farm. And if you know Damariscotta Lake, you know that it's getting developed pretty quickly. And at, uh, about 10 years ago, land, waterfront there was worth $1,000 a foot, basically, to real estate people. She had 6,000 feet. Um, something had to be done. She didn't want to do it. So she sort of said, all right, Gary, you figure out how to, <laughs> how to save this, how to protect this. So I, got in, I was on a little committee over at the Nearing Homestead, and I knew some people from the Trust for Public Land. So I talked to them, and then they talked to the Nature Conservancy, and we eventually ended up just talking locally with the, with the Demerscotta Lake Watershed Association. And we were able to, through conservation easements and sales into conservation easements, we were able to protect basically the, the whole piece of land. Um, and made Kate some money, too, but that wasn't the prime factor. I, I just really wanted to, s to never have to see any of that get taken away. Um, it hurts me. I mean, it's, it's, there's about 40 acres of forest, and it's now in tree growth, and it, I, I still am in pain every time a logging truck goes out there to take some of, that tree, some of those trees away, but they'll come back. You know, so, but, um, so I feel really akin to Friends of Mary Meeting Bay because we're trying to do something that's in the same spirit um, right where we live, literally where we live. Um, I don't, I, we're not sure yet what's going to happen to the house. Um, it may go back to the land trust because we own it. We didn't have to pay for it. Um, and I'm not, well, you guys all, you know I'm a capitalist, right? Because I, I, you come in my bookstore, right? <laughs> I'm just in it for the money. <laughs> so anyway, I live, at, I live at this beautiful farm. And Kate was once asked what the crop at the farm was. And really, there wasn't any cash crop in terms of agriculture at the farm, although the hay did for a while. There were no animals there, so the hay did get sold or bartered for other stuff. Um, but really, Kate, Kate's response to that was the real crop of the farm was words. And between Henry Best and Elizabeth Coatsworth, they wrote and published 150 books. And then their daughter, Kate Barnes, became the first poet laureate of the state of Maine, and she published four books of poems in her lifetime as well. So that's a pretty good score in terms of literary uh, proliferation into the world. And Elizabeth won her first kid's book, won the, won the Newbery. I mean, you know, these, these Elizabeth Coatsworth's first book was a little book of poems. It won the Borzoi Prize and the Yale Younger Poets Prize, and she had to choose which one to take. This is not a bad start to your literary <laughs> career. You know, she did pretty well. Most of her books are out of print now, um, which is too bad, but books come and go. Uh, Henry's book, people are most, um, they, they know the outermost house the most. That's kind of the book that people know. That's his from away book when he was, but the background of that book I like to share with people. Uh, I, I work with a group of combat veterans, writers, and we've talked about this. Henry was part of a group of Harvard students who went to the First World War as ambulance drivers. And Henry's maternal side of his family was French. So he spoke fluent French. So he got to the war, and they put him right on the front lines at Verdun. And he was there for almost a year, um, 
carting away the bodies of, of uh, broken service people from Verdun and just going through a, 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 what to me is an unimaginable hell. I mean, that was sheer mass slaughter. And you do a year of that and you come back to the United States and all of a sudden you find your way out to the end of Cape Cod and live in a little hut all by yourself uh, with the forces of nature and, and all of the guys in my writing group say, this is PTSD and this is healing. Um, but no one ever l looks at it that way, except his biographer, who th there's about to be a biography of Henry comes up. But one of Henry's very first books was called A Volunteer Poilu, and it's about his year as an ambulance driver in the First World War. And it's just the stuff he saw was horrific. So he came back and didn't want to live in Hingham, didn't want to live in Boston, and went out to Cape Cod. And then he, he met Elizabeth and fell in love and got married and, th and they, they lived in Massachusetts for a little while but Henry really didn't want to be there and didn't really like the city. Um, so Henry and Elizabeth, Henry was writing um, a couple kids books and one of the illustrators for one of the kids books was a guy named Maurice, Morris Jake Day from Damascata originally and Jake had a houseboat on Damascata Lake and he invited Henry and Elizabeth to come up and spend some time on Damariscotta Lake in the houseboat. And this was back 1930. There weren't cottages on Damariscotta Lake. There were no motor boats. There were, God thank him, there were no jet skis. There were no idiots with donut things in back of their boats going in circles um, for whom I'm still setting traps. I like to have logs just below the surface of the water. If you've got a pretty shallow, uh, you know, it works. It works. Um, so, he and so Henry and Elizabeth came to Maine. How many of you know about Jake Day? Any, any, a, f a, a few of you know about Jake Day. Jake, um, incredible artist, incredible illustrator. He went to work for Disney Studios and decided that Bambi should be a deer from this part of the world and not a California deer. So he live shipped deer and some other animals out to California where Disney artists um, drew the artwork for, for Bambi. Uh, Bambi actually takes place in what looks remarkably like one of Jake's favorite places um, in Baxter State Park now. So this was a combination of interesting guys, Jake Day and Henry Beston, and Henry's equally, if not more, interesting wife Elizabeth, who, who I'm if I were to vote for which of the two is my favorite, Elizabeth wins hands down every day. But when you get to the farm, there's this big rock with this big plaque on it that's Henry's grave. And then Elizabeth has the little name thing that the undertakers put when, when you die. Um, and that's it. Um, and, you know, she published 125 books. He published 25. Um, sorry, that's just my <laughs> Yeah. She's great. So I want to start, I'm going to read you some things from the three of them talking about this place. And, and I'd be glad, anytime you have a question, please let me know, because I'm, I'm not sure what you want to know. And I'm not even sure how to behave as a, as a Friends of Mary Meeting Bay event, because uh, I'm, I'm a friend of, of uh, you know, Damariscotta Lake. But I'm also a friend of Mary Meeting Bay. Why, why shouldn't we be friends with all the watersheds around here? You know, like, some are nicer than others, but that's, that's. But this is Mrs. Coatsworth. Now, Elizabeth died in 1986. She was in her 90s. Uh, but listen to this thinking. This is the, the last paragraph of this book, Main Memories. I'm really glad that this book is out of print because in the beginning, it has a map to the house. <laughs> Literally, right to the house. And the pilgrims show up there. I mean, we get a lot of, in the summer, we get a lot of pilgrims. They're mostly Henry pilgrims. We don't let them in the house. Elizabeth Pilgrims, come in the house. You know, we were, we're. So this is, this is Elizabeth writing. And if Americans are to become really at home in America, it must be through the devotion of many people to many small, deeply loved places. The field by the sea, the single mountain peak seen from a man's door, the island of trees and farm buildings in the western wheat must be sung and painted and praised until each takes on the gentleness of the thing long loved and becomes an unconscious part of us 
and we of it. For we are not yet at ease with our own land, and it is restive and often sullen with us, like a horse which has been roughly broken to riding and is left frequently standing uncared for in the rain. So the idea that this land must be through, seen through the devotion of many people to many small, deeply loved places. How much closer to Friends of Mary Meeting Bay can you get? You know? I mean, every watershed needs people like this. Every watershed. Um, because every place is holy. Um, although I'm tired of the pilgrims that come <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so whenever Elizabeth traveled... Elizabeth was an incredible traveler. In 19, 1918, when she graduated from college, she and her sister went to the Philippines, Japan, and China. And they rode horseback in China. 1918, you know, I mean, this is unusual. It was unusual enough for them to see white women, but to see them riding horses. Uh, you know, I mean, and all through, when, when she and Henry got married uh, in the late 20s, they went to the Yucatan on their honeymoon. And the Yucatan hadn't even been, I mean, it was, it was pretty much vines and overgrown. You know, I mean, but, and she traveled, and wherever she went, she wrote a kid's book about the places where she went. And she would try to be as precise and not fanciful about those places. She didn't really try to romanticize a lot. She tried to be sort of correct to the culture. I mean, her Newbery Award book is about Japan and Buddhism. Uh, you know, the cat who went to heaven. And, and she tries to be true to the place and not, you know, not just create. So this is this wonderful book called Houseboat Summer. And I don't, you, you can look at it afterwards. The end papers are actually, this is literally, I've got photographs of the interior of the houseboat, and this is literally what it looked like on the interior of the houseboat. So I just wanted to, um, this is just when they, when they first, get to the houseboat. These, this is two little kids who are coming up to spend the summer on the houseboat. They were standing by open water and there were stars in the sky about them. Two boards held up by posts made a little dock at which a, a rowboat awaited them. Now they could see they were in a long narrow cove between two pine covered hills and something darkened the water before them like a small island. But as Uncle Jim rowed nearer they could see that it was not an island but a boat unlike any boat they had ever heard of. Something was struggling in Bill's mind, a memory of the time when he was very little and had the measles and unsteady toy camels and tigers and deer and elephants had walked two by two over his blanket toward just such a boat with a narrow deck along its sides, wider at each end and a sloping roof over a rectangular box in which the animals lived. It's a houseboat, cried Sandy. Bill. We're going to live on a houseboat. No, Bill said, it's the ark. <laughs> and that's what they called it. It was called the ark. And it remained there in Deep Cove until finally it started leaking too much. So they hauled it ashore and it became a cottage. Um, and pretty much now there's a few planks and the, the outhouse seat. Uh, are all that remain out there in the woods. So we, we've been thinking about putting the outhouse seat on the internet, you know. Henry Beston sat here. Um, <laughs> which, you know, we could probably fund some more conservation easements with that kind of thing. But <laughs> you have to always be, be thinking about these things. Um, but they did call it the Ark, and it was, I mean, it, that, that pretty well describes it. So here's so then Henry and Jake go go over to the, you can from Deep Cove you walk through the woods and you come to the farm uh, and they would go through the woods and go over to the farm and the the local grocery stores would deliver out there so they could they wouldn't they didn't have to go to town that summer if they didn't want to and they could buy milk and butter and stuff from from the farm and uh, one day they were they were having a conversation. Uh, um, with the farmer, and he said, the farmer said, know anyone who'd like to buy my farm, Mr. Day? And uh, Jake said to Henry, it's next to the Rollinses on East Neck, and Henry said, I'd like to buy it. So uh, they ended up buying the farm, and uh, uh, they were back in Massachusetts, and the banker sent them the final telegram, and, and uh, 
the banker said, we have met the Bennetts and they are ours, map, vein, and manure pile. <laughs> so, so Elizabeth says, um, and so the farm became ours. So far as human beings may ever possess the aged granite and the pine and the beech growing by their own fierce will to live and the hay striving to keep its place against the forest and passing creatures which take, which take up their residence there for a season, the pileated woodpeckers of our slash pile, the doe with her two fawns at this moment wandering our woods, the porcupines whose paths no longer lead to our apple trees because this summer there are no apples. All these things, some as old as the earth and some with only a few hours span of life are not really ours except by a kind of legal quibble. The farm in one form or another will outlive all of its masters and man himself. But we do own the house and the barn and the stone walls and the fruit trees. They were made by man's will and are dependent upon us. The house should be rather grateful to us, I think, for its pleasant lines of the 1830s had been much disfigured. And though we, although we have not tried to turn the clock back to the original form, we have remade its harmony. It's a pretty nice way to think about what you live. You don't really own it. You, know, you may make it uglier by clearing it and putting a house on it, and making a driveway, and parking your car there, and putting up a dish or something, and you know what I mean? Uh, but do you own it? Um, or does it own you? And in, in the best way, you know, I've lived there since 1986. I've never felt a desire to own it. I just more and more want to be there. Most of my days I'm here. You know, I, I live in this incredible place, and I spend six days a week inside a bookstore being a capitalist. It's, it's, a, it's an odd, weird... I don't want to grow up to be a capitalist, you know? So I refuse to grow up. Um, there are pictures, at, at the end if you want to go over there, I, I brought some, some copies of books that relate to the farm and some photographs and a calendar. In, in 2006, one of our many fundraising things was we did a calendar of old photos of the farm that we, that we sold through the land trust up there. Um, we also, when she was talking about the apple trees, we also were selling uh, apple trees um, Kavanaugh apples, which, which are from Damariscotta Mills, uh, the mills of the Kavanaugh's. Uh, so they're poet, poetic apples, and they were, they were down to three or four trees known in, in existence, and, and we got John Bunker interested, and he's been grafting, and uh, through the land trust we sold about 36 or 40 of them, and we know where they all are. Um, I just want to follow that up with a couple poems by Elizabeth. When she was talking about trying to keep the hay fields and, and the woods coming back. And if any of you have tried to keep hay fields, you know how fast that happens. Um, so my end, when I, when I, I made her two and a half million dollars when I did all the stuff with the land trust and stuff. And Kate asked me what I wanted to do with it. And I said, well now, it says here that I have to keep 12 acres in pasture. You know, and I'd been trying to mow it with a riding lawnmower. I'd been through three decks in two years of, of a riding lawnmower. So I said, you know, you got to, you got to, this is my end, buy me a tractor so I can cut this stuff, you know. So now, but then the, the land trust comes in and I can't cut it till after August 1st because there's bobolinks and there's bluebirds and there's, you know, all these other sweethearts out there. So I don't get a first cutting and a second cutting. I just get, I just get the one cutting after, the, after those guys are gone, which is fine, you know, I, mean, I don't care. Uh, and it's nice to have bluebirds and bobolinks. It's pretty nice. And there's a, there's a section of milkweed that we don't cut for the, for the butterflies. So, you know, there's, there's all these, when you start protecting the land but you still want some hay, you have to make some, you have to consider all the other folks who live there. You know, you have to really consider that. Um, which is kind of fun because that means you have to learn about all the other folks that live there and what they're up to and what their cycles are. You know, and I'm, well. So this is, this is, uh, um, This is a poem by Elizabeth. It's called This Green Field. This green field is the masterpiece of many hands. Here you, may, you, here you may know backs strained and thighs and wills were bent and sweat poured out to make it so. Cut, cleaned, and tended, now it lies docile to man while he stands near. But let him turn 
and it will slip into the thickets like a deer. And it's that pretty much that fast, you know. Uh, and this is a poem of hers called Wood Farm. The genius of this spot is one who loves the sound of loons at night and heifer bells in the rock pastures chiming in the dark who loves bobolinks and swallows and the smells of hot, small strawberries mixed with meadow flowers and winds that ruffle slopes of hay and bright, large clouds reflected in transparent water and apples falling in the dead of night. The genius of this spot is calm and rural, accustomed to the scythe and to the plow, a lover of the barnyard and the haystack, the heavy udder and the fruit-hung bough, Yet there is something more, a grace, a lightness, a hint of danger, darkness of the wood, a savage gravity that suggests this godhead inherits through his mother, Sylvan blood. But the whole first, when I read that first section, it's all still happening. You know, the loons are still there. We can still hear the heifer bells. The bobolinks are there. The swallows are there. The little strawberries are there. The, the wind and the hay, it's all there. You know, it hasn't left. And I don't want it to leave. You know, it, it's, our neighbor just sold his mother. He just inherited his mother's farmhouse, an 1830s farmhouse. And he tore it down to the ground and sold the land that went down to the lake from the house. And two lawyers from Washington, D.C., thank God for them, uh, uh, have built. It. But it is an ugly, <laughs> ugly... Uh, and it's right on the edge. They couldn't build within 100 feet of the lake, so it's at 101, I'm sure, I'm convinced. It's a, it's a you know. But that's, a, that's an interesting one. We live, you know, this house is pretty much at the end of the road, and there are now six other houses out there. But in the winter, we're the only people there. They're all gone. The snowplow, the first two storms this year, didn't come because they thought nobody lives down there. When the power goes out, you know, we're the last people in the camp. Forget about it. You know, you know, the rich people are gone, so who's going to complain? Um, sorry. This is, just, this is just an Elizabeth poem that I just like. I, I, it has nothing to do with the farm, but it has everything to do with the farm. This is called Song of the Rabbits Outside the Tavern. I really, you know, Elizabeth, she has this sort of image as this really proper, intelligent, Massachusetts lady from a pretty well-to-do family. And then you start listening to what she's actually saying. I mean, this, this lady's down. I mean, she, she's, I really. So this is Song of the Rabbits outside the tavern. We who play under the pines, we who dance in the snow that shines, blue in the light of the moon, sometimes halt as we go, stand with our ears erect, our noses testing the air to gaze at the golden world behind the windows there. Suns they have in a cave and stars each on a small white stem and the thought of a fox or a night owl seems never to trouble them. They laugh and eat and are warm. Their food seems ready at hand. While hungry out in the cold, we little rabbits stand. But they never dance like we dance. They have not the speed nor the grace. We scorn both the cat and the dog who lie by their fair fireplace. We scorn them licking their paws, their eyes on the upraised spoon. We who dance hungry and wild under the winter's moon. Yeah. How can you not like this woman? <laughs> it's weird, though. It's weird. I, you know, I. I sleep in the room where she slept. I sleep in the room where she died. Her stuff is still there. In the next room is the room where Henry died. His stuff is all still there. Their stuff is everywhere in the house. Their clothes are there. Their, you know, all the stuff they collected on all their trips, their books, their letters, it's all still in the house. And they literally both died in the house. And they're both buried you know, like 200 feet from the house. Uh, it's, it's, but I'm, I feel haunted in a really good way. You know, if I get a chance to talk about them, I don't talk about them. I give them a chance to talk. You know, here I am. Use me, and and I love having, especially having Elizabeth talk through me. Because I, I, I guess you could tell that. I don't have to tell you. 
<laughs> but it's part of why, unlike some kinds of conservation lands, this land is being conserved not just because of where it is, but what it has meant to people. I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that thousands of people have read accounts of this place over the last 70 years. Um, and it has meant something to people. And maybe it's made them think about places a little bit differently. Um, which is, you know, when she's talking about all the people that should celebrate that deeply loved place, you need writers and painters and dancers and musicians. I mean, that's part of instilling that love and, and, and opening up other people's hearts to thinking about that way. And that's part of what Friends of Mary Meeting Bay does. It gets you to think about a place in maybe a whole bunch of different ways. Um, you can do archaeology or wild rice or salamanders and frogs, you know, all these things. Um, so Henry, Henry wrote a book called Northern Farm, which is actually a collection of... <laughs> uh, originally, it was, going, it was a column in Robert La Follette's magazine, The Progressive, which is pretty good politics for Henry, I think. Um, he moved to the farm. He and Elizabeth owned it in the 30s, but they only lived there in the summers. Came up from Massachusetts. Is this a familiar story? Um, but in the 40s, Henry so objected to the Second World War that he moved up to the farm and, never, and didn't go back to the city um, and just wanted to be there. And wrote letters to Roosevelt about the war, <laughs> which went unheeded. Uh, <laughs> Um, so this is from the farm, far Henry, the, the Northern Farm is sort of divided into a sort of deeply philosophical essay and then a diary of what's happening at the farm, and it goes back and forth between those things. So, so here Henry says, and I, th I thought, well, yeah, this is, this is a good time to read this. After a great snowstorm, three pairs of snowshoes stand in a drift outside a friend's kitchen door. The neighbors have dropped in for a call. On a morning bright with a glassy wind and full of whirled up dust of snow, the welcome snowplow comes in sight. Everybody aboard the truck bundled up in heavy clothes like winter bears, the hearty outdoor faces glowing with the cold. A youngster home from Iceland walks behind a shovel over the shoulder of his navy pea jacket and bright red protectors on his ears. To town on this cold day, finding various cars frozen up and snorting steam like dragons, the smell of radiator alcohol strong along the sidewalk. One car radiator is covered over with quite a nice patchwork quilt. How pleasant it is to get home from such a trip and find the house warm, sunlit, and at peace. The last of a great stick of wood still glowing in the kitchen stove. Standing beside the range, Elizabeth meditatively warms her hands. And then he just jumps. The chromium millennium ahead of us, I gather, is going to be an age whose ideal is a fantastically unnatural human passivity. We are to spend our lives in cushioned easy chairs, growing indolent and heavy, while intricate slave mechanisms do practically everything for us. What a really appalling future what normal human being would choose it, and what twist of the spirit has created this sluggish paradise. I do not mean that we should take the hardest way. Compromises are natural and right. But a human being protected from all normal and natural hardship simply is not alive. <laughs> um. And he, this is the next page. How wise were the ancients who never lost sight of the religious significance of the earth? They used the land to the full, draining, plowing, and manuring every inch, but their use was not an attack on its nature, nor was the ancient motherhood of earth ever forgotten in the breaking and preparing of soil. They know, as all honest people know in their bones, that in any true sense there is no such thing as ownership of the earth and that the shadow of any man is but for a time cast upon the grass of any field. What remains is the earth, the mother of life, as the ancients personified the mystery, the ancient mother in her robes of green or harvest gold, and the sickle in her hand. If we are to live and have something to live for, 
let us remember, all of us, that we are the servants as well as the masters of the fields. So you can see that those two were talking to each other, listening to each other, supporting each other's art, but also just they were really well paired, I think. These two, and they were, you know, and they were both kind of city people from well-to-do backgrounds. Elizabeth's family had, <laughs> we tried, Elizabeth's family had, um, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice, sugar plantations in Jamaica. And we looked them all up, and, and Beth and I went to Jamaica, and we tried to figure out where they were, but we did not want to say, you know, we're looking for the white owners of these plantations <laughs> from 100 years ago. But it was, it was interesting to see sort of where, where their background came from. Um, and then this little piece, I thought, today's the 11th, right, of, of February, so this is Henry again. If the solar turn in December marks the return of light and the first great step forward of our northern year, something happens in February while the, which the countryman can only call the second great milestone of the annual rebirth. It is not a turn as definite as the solar reversal, but it is every bit as real and powerful. With us at Chimney Farm, it comes about February 10th every year. And even as I write, the mystery is upon us at the farm. It is the ritual moment when winter, still visibly unconquered, and even with weeks to go, has nevertheless lost the ascendancy, and the great vital forces appear and show themselves in a first promise of their power. It is not entirely a matter of light, great as I believe the influence of light to be. It is not yet the rebirth of warmth, for the sun as warmth does not come into power till the end of February, it is really a kind of entrance into action of the life forces, a stirring, a shaking, and an awakening of all that, that will remake our cold and dormant world. As the witch of Endor said to King Saul, I see gods ascending out of the earth. So that's yesterday, so uh, yeah, maybe there are some God's ascending out of the earth. We've replaced them with a groundhog <laughs> as ascending out of the earth, you know. <laughs> Trying to see its shadow. Um, so, okay. These guys had two daughters. A daughter, Margaret, and a daughter, Kate. Um, Margaret went off to... Alaska and Colorado and, and uh, pretty much left home. Kate married when she was young and went to California where she raised and trained horses and children. <laughs> and <laughs> the horses worked out better. Um, <clears throat> and then when Kate's mother was ill, Kate d uh, had been through a really bad divorce and moved back to Maine to help take care of her mother and her mother helped buy her a farm up in Appleton that's also under negotiations with two different land trusts. She had 250 acres of basically blueberry field on the top of Appleton Ridge. Um, but Kate for a while stayed at the farm again. She came back and stayed at Chimney Farm and she had horses there. She raised um, Suffolk Punch draft horses, which are the horses I took care of. Um, she had a shire who was, she bought him from a, a um, ski area. So he was this great bomb-proof horse who did sleigh rides and hay rides. So there's a picture of him over there with Beth and I in our, in our sleigh, zipping around with, with our shire. Uh, when, when she had six horses and a pony, she gradually sold them, mostly to Amish farmers from Pennsylvania. And when she got down to one horse, he was really lonely, so we, we got him two little donkeys to keep him company. And now he's gone, and we're in this donkey cycle now. So there are no more horses at the farm, but there are donkeys. And, and I won't go into the ass jokes, but I have a, an incredible vocabulary of ass jokes at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Which you have to have if you have donkeys. <laughs> So this is Kate writing about, writing about the farm also, called In the Pasture. It would be impossible to draw these three workhorses without a pencil of light as they stand broadside to the afternoon sun 
outlined with narrow lines of fire around their vast chestnut forms, almost black against the dazzle. The young mare swings her long tail from hip to hip, and her titian blonde male hangs over her shoulder like the ringletted chevelure of a Victorian belle, innocent and alluring. Beyond her, the two big geldings, brothers and teammates, scratch each other's wide red backs with careful incisors. Swallows fly over the grass. Cloud shadows cross the lake and darken the blue of the hills on the opposite shore. But in the pasture, the sun is shining. The afternoon wind has driven off the flies. And the three big horses are all at their ease. A small, happy society of souls who are gentle and do no harm, who live in God's pocket who spend the long summer days moving from sunshine to shade and back to the sun, who want nothing but to be where they are. <laughs> much like us when we're there, we, we pretty much want nothing but to be where we are. Those were beautiful horses. The, the, the pair, the, the two guys, um, were logging horses. And the first two winters I lived there, they were working and we would go out on the logging sled because um, they only worked in the winter when the ground was frozen and, and, did, and they lugged stuff out in the snow so there were no skitter trails. And, and, and you know, if they disturbed anything, they also pooped. So you know, it was quite, <laughs> it was very efficient and fun. And so we would go out and, and ride on the logging sled and hang out with the horses. And this is, uh, Kate did that too. And this is, this is a Kate, uh, oh, I just love this poem. I read this at her funeral, actually. It's called Inside the Stone. Up in the woods, in the circle among the beech trees, last winter one of the lumber horses split a stone horizontally with a clip of his big steel shoe. It had seemed to be a plain gray stone, but when it was opened, a black wall appeared, rusty at the edges, flecked with pale checks like unknown constellations, and over all floated wisps of blue-gray trailing feathers of clouds. I brush away the fallen leaves and stare into the distance inside that stone. If one could become a bird, if one could fly into that dark night, if one could enter the light of those stars, and then the woods become very still, the beech leaves blur at the edge of my vision, I find I am bending lower and lower. Uh, and this is another poem about the logging sled. Kate was a big woman, and she would be out in the logging sled in, in, in a lot of clothes to stay warm, but her pockets would be full of apples and carrots, and the horses knew this, and they were all, they would <laughs> gather around her and say, yeah, going after her pa. It was a great, oh, what a great scene. This is called the logging sled. And she would be so happy, you know, just, ah. I catch a ride on the logging sled and go out to the woods. As we cross the deep drifted field, we see five snow geese high overhead, flying almost confusedly. It's early yet. The lake is still frozen tight with trucks on it. The geese must be casting about for open rivers north of us. In the clearing, I step up to the horses' heads and stand with them while the sled is loaded. I am as gray and heavy as a badger. The pockets of my old coat sag with carrots and books. The horse's nose at my hands. The wood thunks into the sh sled, and I hear the blue jay squalling behind me among the pines. I smell a dampness in the air that promises spring. To whom can I say how happy this all makes me? So are you getting a sense that these people really like this piece of land? Because I mean, that's what I'm trying to. Um, but out of that comes comes a responsibility. You can't you can't just say, "Oh, this is a great place. It's beautiful, and I like it." You're going to leave. You're mortal. You're going to leave, and that land's going to stay there. What's going to happen to it next? Do you have some responsibility about the future? Um, sometimes I think the best thing we can do for that future is to reintroduce radis radis and have the plague take us all, you know, get rid of the humans so that it, the, the future will be better. Um, but that's a really pessimistic kind of thing. But, 
<laughs> but, uh, but you know, there are all sorts of different ways to express that and to work that into the consciousness of the public, some of whom might, you know, have a little change of heart. So it's, it's, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's, so what is the writer's role? I'm, 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 I think about this a lot. What is the writer's role in connection with a place that you deeply love? These people obviously deeply love this place. You know. And now, now I've got that place in one way, and I've got to figure out how to continue its existence in their spirit, but more than in their spirit, in the spirit of the place. Right? What's good for the turtles who live there? What's good, what's good for those birds? What's good for the deer? What's, what's good for <laughs> the turkeys who come through every day? I don't know what's good for them. Eating probably is good for them. But, but, um, <laughs> but they live there. You know, so there's, they're all kind of a responsibility. But the, but the future of the place is a responsibility, I think. And, and I, you know, we all have different ways that, that we can lend a hand. So as, as a supposed poet, what's my way in lending a hand? For them, writing was their way of trying to get other people to love their places. This, these, these books aren't necessarily intended to make you love the farm. They want you to think about where you are, right? Um, yeah, bye -bye. So this, and this is Kate taking a walk with her mother. And she's going down the, she's, well, they're coming up from the place where we swim now. Oak trees stretch their branches from the stone pile with the cows in their shade. Below, the ground was wet as my mother and I pushed through a fringe of bushes into water almost as warm as blood on that hot July afternoon. Here and there, our feet found jets of coolness where springs under the lake floor streamed freshly upward. My mother set out in her stately breaststroke, her head up like a turtle's. I splashed at angles to her course, half dog paddling, half at a crawl. When I got tired, I put out one hand onto her shoulder. At the mouth of the cove, we paused, treading water, to pick water lilies floating on their long stalks over the green rafts of their leaves. We carried them, sopping and perfumey, up toward the house where they would live a long time in a wide bowl on the table, unfolding their cool white petals every day and closing them in darkness. When we were halfway up the hill, my mother stopped to look at a monarch butterfly on a hawkweed that swayed slightly while the thin, bright wings above it slowly opened and closed. I watched her leaning over it so intently in her rusty old black bathing suit, and then, quite suddenly, Quite without warning, the world became alive. It seemed to breathe, the red top bending in the afternoon wind, the clouds drifting north, the water lilies tangled and dripping in our arms, cat's paws beyond the island, cloud shadows on the hills, the orange and black wings slightly trembling above the orange flower that was moving too. In a little while, I couldn't stand it anymore. What are you doing, I asked. And then I guessed it, something she usually didn't speak of. Are you thinking of things for a poem? She paused another moment before she said yes, quietly, as if she had just woken up and needed to sleep a little longer. The rest of the way, I didn't talk. I could almost hear the words combining in her mind, the lines gathering inside her head like butter when it suddenly starts to come, when it clumps up thick in the churn. Right. So I'm just going to read two poems of my own, and then I'll stop, and, and you won't have to listen to me. You can ask questions, though. I'd love that. Um, this is... I wrote this in 1987. I'd been at the farm for a year, and we had a big stallion, Ironside Jack, who was a, a United States champion um, Suffolk Punch stallion, and people were bringing mares there, and there was a lot of sex going on. It was quite exciting. That was, that was his job, to make little baby Suffolk Punches. 
and he was sold to the to the Amish to these Amish farmers who came in, and he he had the stall right at the end of the barn, so he was always sticking his head out. And I went up to the barn to see what what he was watching. You know, what do you see from from Jack? So this is. There's an empty stall in the barn where Ironside Jack the stallion lived. Last week, two Amish farmers and their driver came and took him to Pennsylvania along with Sally the mayor. From Jack's stall in the barn, you see the farmhouse, weathered, red, and surrounded by flowers. Beyond the house, you look east over the horse pasture and down to the lake. There are vegetables and wild lupin off to your right and the place where the town road ends. Near dusk, the horses walk to the fence gate, hoping for grain. These horses haul our winter wood, turn the earth for our gardens. They give us warmth and life. Jack was like the guardian spirit of the place, always watching everything from here in his stall. Across the lake, cottage windows reflect the setting sun. Birds fill the air with sound. The light in the kitchen is yellow. Fog moves in behind the islands, and everything starts to quiet. Later, the loons will call from the cove. We will sleep, dreaming of wind, of rain, of horses moving in the barn, and loon song, loon song pulling us into the dark water. We dive under, dive under, and come up somewhere else. And I'll just read this one more poem. And then I hope somebody has questions. Um, this is a poem about being haunted. Like I said, sometimes that place can really haunt you when you think of it. The power of their lives is, I mean, there are all these books about their life at the farm. You know, I know when these roses were planted. I, I know when these <laughs> lilies were planted. I know, you know, I, I know all this stuff. We all should have that for the places where we live. I've got a hundred years of written history, natural history of the place where I live, of direct observation by, the, by three generations of people before me. I mean, what a treasure to have. And they were tuned into stuff. Some clear night like this, when the stars are all out and shining, our old dogs will come back to us out of the woods and lead us along the stone wall to the cove. There will be foxes and loons and a houseboat floating on the lake. The trees will lean in, a lantern swinging over the water, the creaking of oars. Now we will learn the true names of the stars. Now we will know what the trees were saying. There is wood in the stove. We left the front door open. Does the farmhouse know that we're never coming back? Hmm. 